So welcome, welcome. Um, I recognize quite a few of those names. So welcome back to those of you who've been here before. For those of you who have not, um, welcome for the first time. We are the Marine Environmental Education Center located at the Carpenter House. Um, we are actually on Hollywood Beach, Florida. And unfortunately right now we are still closed. Um, we are working on getting open um, and we will be sure to keep everyone updated as we move forward with any opening plans. But until then, we are going to continue to provide as many virtual resources as we can to our community um, through the form of our webinar series. Um, so we did move our webinar series to every Saturday at 1 p.m. Um, so make sure you check out our social media at Seek the Meek for the full schedule. Um, but today we are lucky enough to be talking to Annalise. Um, she is part of the Everglades Foundation. She's going to be teaching us a lot about um, the Everglades, uh, a lot of things that I'm not as familiar with because we do focus very heavily on the marine science here at the Marine Environmental Education Center. So we're very excited to learn more about a wider field. Um, so right now we do have everyone's videos off and everyone is muted um, and it's going to stay that way throughout the webinar um, just so you can most clearly hear and see Annalise. Um, but if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and if you want to answer any of the questions that she is posing, feel free. There's a little button at the bottom where you can raise your hand. Um, so click that button at the bottom of your screen and we will be able to unmute you so you can answer it. Otherwise, you could just throw it in the chat. Um, I think that is about it for me. So whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Taylor. It is such a pleasure to be here today. And thank you everyone for joining. Uh, like Taylor said, my name is Annalise. I'm visiting from the Everglades Foundation. Um, so just a heads up, by the way, I'm in a public space. So bear with me. I hope everything goes smoothly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so we can start the presentation. Alrighty. So everyone, Taylor, if you could just let me know, can you see my screen? Well, yeah. Yes, it's loading. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then, like she said, you guys are more than welcome to answer my questions throughout the PowerPoint presentation in the chat. Or if you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself and answer the questions. So, yes, today we will be talking, of course, about the Everglades ecosystem. And so I want to give a little background, of course, about the Everglades Foundation. So we are an environmental nonprofit located here in Miami, Florida. And our mission is to restore and protect the American Everglades. So we do this through many means, and that would be from you know, policy, advocacy, science, and education. I work in the education department. We have a mighty team of six, and we are a statewide program working with K-12 students and teachers to make sure that they're learning about the Everglades ecosystem. Sorry, guys. What's that? My apologies, like I said, I'm in a public space. Alrighty, so we want to just give a basic Everglades presentation. It's Everglades 101. And I wanted to know about the audience. So how many of you guys have actually been to the Everglades? Just go ahead and raise your virtual hand if you can, um, if you've learned about the Everglades or if you've visited the Everglades. Maybe you guys in the chat can write some things that you have experienced in the Everglades or um, you know, have you guys gone on airboat rides? Have you guys gone fishing or hiking? Anything like that? Awesome. So I see TJ says, I have. Awesome. Oh, you saw a python in the wild. That is crazy. Yeah, so we do have a huge problem with Burmese pythons right now. And we can talk more about that in a little bit in the PowerPoint. So good to know some of you guys have been out there, but for the others, if you have not, it's absolutely okay. This is not, you know, an expert presentation. I definitely am going to be going over the basics in terms of the ecosystem, the water, the habitats and the animals. So something I do like to point out on this slide, there's two images on the right and these images look very different, right? These look like completely different locations, but it is, the Everglades. Both of these are different habitats within the Everglades. So some takeaway I hope you guys will really learn about is how diverse and how vast the Everglades really is. So our Everglades is one of the most unique places in the world and I hope to share more about that throughout this presentation. So where is the Everglades? I definitely want to hear some answers in the chat if we can. 
where do you guys think, based on this map, of course, of Florida, where is the Everglades? So I see, oh yeah, airboat rides in Shark Valley. Awesome. So does anyone know if we are here, well, most of us, I'm here in Miami. If we're down here, where is the Everglades in relation to us? If you don't know, maybe you can take a guess. South of Lake Okeechobee, that is correct. So that is a part of the Everglades, nice. But it's actually much larger than just South Florida. Yeah, I see some more South answers. So the Everglades is very large. It actually spans from the Orlando Kissimmee area as we see depicted by the red star down to the Florida Bay, actually to the Florida Keys. So we can see here that the Everglades, um, it's, it's not just freshwater, it also incorporates some marine, some salt water, and that's why we're here presenting with the Marine Center. Um, but the Everglades is very vast. It's actually starting with fresh rainfall in the chain of lakes in the Orlando area, and it flows, connects all the way to Lake Kissimmee, down to the Kissimmee River, and then it goes into Lake Okeechobee. Historically, Lake Okeechobee would overflow with this fresh uh, rainfall, this water, and it would move south all the way through here to the Florida Bay. And then this is where you get that mixture of fresh and salt water along the coastlines. So we nicknamed the Everglades KOE for Kissimmee Okeechobee Everglades. And where does it get its name? So ever actually comes from the word forever. And glades is an old word that means a grassy open place. So the Everglades has many different habitats, but one of the most distinct would be the Sawgrass Marsh, which is a large grassy open place. And I'll show you pictures of that in just a moment. Also, the indigenous tribes who have lived in the Everglades for many, many years, they've also nicknamed the Everglades their own word. Peihayoki is what they call it. And that uh, directly translates to grassy waters. So again, that grassy, watery place, that is what it's known for. And of course, why am I talking about the Everglades? Why is there an entire nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting and restoring the Everglades? It must be important, right? And you are correct. It is in fact extremely important, probably a lot more important than most people assume or even understand. So our Everglades is a huge watershed system. It's actually a river. And this river, it's one of the largest, the widest and most slow moving rivers in the world. And it moves about a quarter mile a day. But this watershed system provides so much for us in terms of ecosystem services um, that we really need to work to understand it better and to protect it. So what do I mean by ecosystem services? Does anyone wanna share what they think? So ecosystem services are natural services that the environment provides to us for free. And we humans, we really get the benefits of what the, the ecosystem provides to us. So what examples? So, you know, the Everglades is defined and connected by this fresh water from the rain, right? So that water is actually filtered throughout the wetland, the watershed system, and that becomes about 40% of Floridians drinking water. So 40% of people who live in Florida rely on the Everglades for their drinking water. If we were to put that into numbers, that's about 8.7 million people. That's a lot of people. That's almost half of the entire state of Florida, correct? We know humans need fresh water to survive. We know plants need that fresh water. Animals need that fresh water. And we really uh, rely on that heavily. We have an aquifer system under underground in which the water is able to filter and um, be stored in that aquifer system and we're able to pump it out with pumping systems and use it as our drinking water. So we don't just use that fresh water for drinking. There are many more uses for that, of course. We also have a huge economy here in the state of Florida and that is relying on tourism, on real estate, on our agriculture, right? There's so many components that go into this this system and, and how much the Everglades is actually providing to us. Just think about all of the impacts and what would collapse if we didn't have that water. 
So some more ecosystem services. Our mangroves in the Everglades, they actually provide us storm protection and they help to prevent soil erosion along the coast. So we know here in Florida with our subtropical climate and our proximity to water, uh, we have a lot of natural you know, hurricanes and lots of storms, right? In the summertime, especially. So these mangroves um, naturally are so dense in their root systems, they're able to provide storm protection as a storm barrier. So they take in that surge from the powerful winds and all of that rain, and they're able to act as our barriers along the coast. So, you know, thank a mangrove next time you see them. <laughs> And I wanted to ask you guys, can you think of any other ecosystem services that the Everglades provides to us? So we know that we get our water from it and we use that water in many different ways. Our mangroves are protectors. What else do you think we get from the Everglades? Yeah, exactly, fish, correct. We get food, we get oxygen, yeah, all of these things, these, natural earth cycles are promoted and are able to process through this watershed system. So very good. And then these are just some images here, of course, airboats. That's fun. Leisure activities get fun out of the Everglades, you guys. We get to enjoy the beautiful sunsets and the beautiful hiking and taking our families out there. So lots and lots of benefits. Um, furthermore, we have more ecosystem services. So we also have flood control and water storage. So the Everglades is, like I said, a slow moving river and it moves from north to south, right? So because the water moves so slowly, it's able to soak up into the ground throughout certain times of the year. So that provides water storage. And we know that soil will absorb water and you know, concrete and asphalt doesn't really absorb water, right? So when we have this water absorption, we have this water storage, it helps to prevent flooding in our neighborhoods and our homes and our businesses, right? But when we start to put slabs of concrete all over our ground, all over our Everglades ecosystem, we're really reducing the ability for our, our environment to store that water and to prevent flood control. So that's just another uh, food for thought. And then moving on now, we're gonna talk a little bit more fun. We have Everglades habitats are very diverse. So something very special about the Everglades is how diverse it is. And we know a habitat is a home for plants or animals and that provides food, water, shelter, and space. We have so many types of habitats. They can be wet or dry. Within the wet, they can be saltwater, freshwater, or brackish. If you guys go fishing often, you know, there's big differences with those habitats. So this is just a slide of a summary of our five main Everglades habitats. So on the top left, we have ourselves a hardwood hammock that is a very dense, um, you know, there's a canopy, there's a lot of shade, there's not that much sunlight going to the bottom of that habitat. And all of these habitats are going to have different species of animals and plants really that live in them. So we can see here that it's very dense and most likely animals are going to be very hidden in this environment. Next, we have our pinelands in the middle on the top. So this one's much more sparse, much more spread apart, and it's much drier because our sunlight is able to really reach deeply into that habitat. So there's gonna be a whole other type of you know, animals and things. And this habitat is very unique because it's one of the very few that can survive in fire. So these pine slash pine trees are actually adapted over time, over many generations, to be able to with, withstand fire. And we'll talk more about that soon. Next, we have our mangrove swamp. So this is what we were talking about earlier. Our wonderful mangroves that act as a storm barrier. Um, they are protectors of the coast. And this mangrove swamp is brackish water. And we'll learn more about the species that live there in a little bit. Next, we have our cypress swamp. This is one of my personal favorites. Actually, one of my previous jobs, I was a swamp tour guide. So I actually would walk uh, groups of tourists with myself into the cypress swamp. And we would sometimes get you know, waist deep. And it is an absolutely beautiful habitat. And there's 
there's lots and lots of wildlife to see. It's absolutely gorgeous. That's freshwater. And then next we have our sawgrass marsh, nicknamed the river of grass. This is where we get that famous Everglades name, grassy open water. So sawgrass marsh, this looks like a dry habitat. It's in fact a wet habitat. So this is sawgrass, which is actually a, a species of sedge and it loves to grow in water. So this is usually kind of a shallow, maybe, you know, a couple feet deep of water and this sawgrass just flourishes. We don't see a lot of trees or any sort of shrubbery besides the sawgrass and some other uh, wildflowers and things. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the plants because plants are amazing, you guys. So this is a slash pine tree. This is found in the Pinelands habitat, a dry habitat. And this tree grows in the highest elevated areas of the Everglades. So we know it really likes to be in a dry space. So we, the Everglades is very close to sea level. But the highest point is about three to seven feet above sea level. And that's where you'll find this guy. So like I said, this habitat is very unique because it grows or this habitat survives in fire, right? So this slash pine tree has an, a special adaptation. They have fire tolerant bark, multi-layered, very thick bark. They have long needles and seed wings with thick fire resistant stems. So just think about how amazing that plants are really able to adapt and evolve over so many years to have these defense mechanisms, although you know they don't have the ability to move or to communicate, talk, or all these other things that we do or animals do, and plants are able to survive for so long. It's, it's so fascinating to me. Next, um, also bald eagles, fun fact, this is one of my favorite trees to nest in. So if you ever see a slash pine tree, make sure you look up and see if there's any bald eagle nests. Um, furthermore, about the mangroves, this is a slide just showcasing how dense the mangroves are, the different types of mangroves, um, just how they can live in the water, they can live out of the water, and just how resilient these, these species are. And mangroves are found all over the world along coastlines. Um, some restoration projects for certain ecosystems, they are really wanting to promote um, planting more mangroves because they have so many amazing ecosystem services. Not only do they protect us along the coastline, but they also are very important for life cycles of fish species, for instance, or just marine organisms throughout their development stages. For instance, if we have small little crabs or little fish at the early stages in their development, they're easy prey, they're easy picking. So these species will hide in these dense mangrove roots until they're able to fend for themselves, essentially, until they're larger. So removing these mangroves and deteriorating this environment is very impactful to the populations of different species. Next, we have a bald cypress tree. So this tree is probably the opposite of the slash pine because it loves to grow in water and they're pretty unique. So they can grow up to heights of 150 feet or more and they live very long, up to 600 years. Although some have said there are uh, cypress trees that live to be a thousand years old. So very, very old wise trees. <laughs> and they have these funny unique uh, features called cypress knees. So they're knobby segments out of the tree's roots that come out of the water. So it's funny because when I was a tour guide in the cypress swamp, I would be hiking and the water sometimes as you're hiking, the, the soil and things would kind of come up. So it would make the water darker, it's hard to see. And I wouldn't know that I'm, I'm about to walk into a, a, a cypress knee and sometimes you can trip. So it's just funny how these root systems are able to really help stabilize the tree and grow in their own way and adapt in their own way. So one of my favorites, I had to include this, so the Everglades is actually uh, one of the best places to find beautiful orchids. So orchids love a subtropical tropical climate, especially here in Florida. And this is an endangered orchid called the cigar orchid. It's found usually in the cypress swamp area and wetter, more rainy habitats. So like I said, they are endangered. And in the early 20th century, 
cigar orchids amongst many other species of orchids were harvested uh, to, for ornamental use. And they were almost harvested to their extinction. Uh, thankfully, law enforcement started catching on and the community started understanding that this is not good for the environment. So we we're able to stop that and really it's completely illegal. So these species, these populations are, are able to rebound now, although it is a slow process because orchids are extremely specific, very sensitive, they need a special placement on the tree. They need the perfect amount of sunlight, the perfect amount of moisture. So, you know, we're just, we're happy to see that they're still around and that they're still flourishing. And this is actually, these are two images that I took myself when I recently went hiking in Everglades National Park. So absolutely stunning. I was so excited that I even got to see a beautiful, fresh cigar orchid bloom. And I had to share it with you guys. So. Furthermore, they are epiphytic. So that means that they grow on the base of trees. Like I said, they're very specific about their placement. Um, they like to grow on cypress trees or buttonwood trees. And their, their flowers are fragrant. They smell very well and they attract a lot of bees. So they do have a nickname of the bee swarm orchid. And you can kind of tell um, in this picture on the right, if you weren't too close to the orchid, you might think, oh my gosh, is that a swarm of bees? No, it's not. <laughs> Now we're gonna go ahead and look at some Everglades animals, my favorite. Okay, so the most famous, when we think of Florida, probably most think of alligators. When we think of the Everglades, most people think of alligators. So the Everglades is also extremely unique because it is the only place in the entire world that you can find both an American alligator and an American crocodile coexisting in the same ecosystem. So that's pretty extraordinary. So it doesn't mean that they're found in the same habitat necessarily, but still they're both found here in Florida. And I really wanted to ask you guys, can you spot the differences between these two species? Because sometimes people have a hard time, you know, understanding the differences. Yeah, the face, so the snout is different, correct? What else? Do we see any difference in their color, maybe? <laughs> we have, have um, we have special protections for the American alligator and the American crocodile. So the American crocodile is actually endangered and the American alligator is plentiful. We have actually over 1 million alligators in the state of Florida. However, we have put the American alligator on the threatened list as well because it looks so similar to the American crocodile. We don't want anyone confusing them or having any complications with hunting and things. So we just both protect, we protect, we protect both. Yeah, so the one on the left is darker. The alligator is darker, correct? Correct, the teeth are different, very good. So here's just a little outline for you guys so you can see. So yes, the color is different, the snout, the jaw, the size, the habitat amongst many other things. These are the most basic. So the American alligator is usually a darker color, black or gray. The crocodile is a lighter gray. So they're not green, like most cartoons depict. No alligators or crocs are ever green. <laughs> um, the alligator snout is also much wider. It's a U shape and it's kind of round on the end. Whereas the crocodile has a V shaped snout and it's very long and narrow. So that's pretty much the telltale sign um, when you're in the wild, that's pretty much the first thing I would notice about the species, and that's how you really tell the difference right away. Also, as far as the jaw goes, the American alligator has an overbite, so we see just the top row of teeth showing, but the crocodile has even, even size top and bottom jaw, so both teeth are showing the top row and the bottom row, so it looks a little bit scarier in my opinion. We also have a size difference. The American alligator averages between six and 12 feet in length, and the crocodile averages about nine to 16 feet in length. So it's a big boy, it's very large. If you run into a 16 foot crocodile, please get out of there. <laughs> um, both of them, of course, we need to you know, give space, never feed them or try to pet them. Uh, always let nature be nature and let it be wild and observe from a distance, of course. Um, habitats, like I said, they're both found in different habitats. So they won't be, hanging out with each other at all. 
the alligator will be found in a freshwater habitat such as a cypress swamp and the American crocodile prefers saltwater or brackish habitats. So let's say a mangrove swamp, for instance. So something special that I wanted to bring up is how important that the American alligators are to the ecosystem. Um, so the American alligator is actually a keystone species which means that it really has great benefits for the ecosystem and the other animals. If we were to actually take the American alligator out of that food chain or that food web, we would have detrimental impacts. So the American alligator, we have two seasons in the Everglades, wet season and dry season. And the American alligator digs a hole called an alligator hole during the dry season. It does this so it can have a, a huge pool of water to kind of remain so it has water to drink, it has food, it has uh, the ability to alter its temperature throughout the dry season because the water levels do drop significantly and species need water. So because of that, that is why it's a keystone species. These other birds and these frogs and these fish, they all go and congregate into the alligator hole throughout the dry season. So really, he's creating a big pool party for the winter time, essentially. And I wanted to show you guys a really cool video. So this is actually from another one of my hikes. Uh, on the left-hand side, this is just an image. We went during the dry season to find an alligator hole, which is really special because we were able to find one. And these trails are actually from the alligators themselves as they go into the center. Here is the alligator hole. So it's gonna look a lot different than a, the cartoon, which is why I wanted to show you what it's like in real life. And there's actually a lot of alligators here in this hole. And then this video, I hope we can see it. I hope it's like in good enough quality. This video is the alligators feeding in the middle of their alligator hole. They're eating lots of fish. They're having a pool party basically, living their best life. So let's see it. So you can see here. We have multiple alligators eating their fish. They're just hanging out. Yeah, that was that was an amazing sight to watch. Um, gave them space, of course, and just watch them from afar. But that's what it looks like in real life. So some other species found in the Everglades. We have the Florida panther. Oh. I don't know what happened. So we have the Florida panther and the Florida panther is a critically endangered species. It's only found here in the Everglades, in fact. So it's another really special species that are, you know, endemic here. So there's approximately wildlife biologists say about 150 to 200 Florida panthers left completely. That's, that's the total amount left. So it's extremely scary to think. Um, they are working very hard and tirelessly around the clock to, you know, work on restoration efforts, uh, work on repopulating uh, the Florida panther. So we are seeing improvements and their numbers are rising. So we do see little cubs and things and we're really excited that our restoration solutions are working. And then also we have these beautiful roseate spoonbills these birds are so beautiful if you've ever if you guys ever get the chance um, to see a flock of roseate spoonbills flying together in the everglades it's one of the most beautiful calming sights i've ever seen i wish i had a video to show you um, but these roseate spoonbills they're not flamingos like a lot of people think we know that they get their name of course from their beak here and these spoonbills just like flamingos they eat little microorganisms little krill and shrimps and that's what gives them that pink coloration on their wings. So we also have West Indian manatees, which of course are found along the coastlines and sometimes at marinas, and they always love when people are spraying the hose on them and things, but these are nicknamed sea cows. They are gentle giants and they are vegetarian. So these guys don't really have natural predators. They're very large. They can weigh up to 1,500 pounds. Um, but they do, you know, they are friendly, but we, we definitely want to promote leaving them alone, just watching them. Don't really promote.
about touching them as much. You just don't want to harass any wildlife. We also have eastern indigo snakes. These are endangered as well. This is a non-venomous, non-constrictive snake. Um, unfortunately, its main threat, why it's endangered, is due to habitat loss. And we're working on, of course, out of age restoration to remedy that. These guys can get about five to seven feet in length. Next, we have one of my favorites, of course, the loggerhead turtle. So these guys get their name from their large heads. They have probably the largest head out of all the sea turtles. They're very large, they can weigh hundreds of pounds, and they are our main nesters here in South Florida, on the East Coast of Florida, absolutely. And right now, we're actually in sea turtle nesting season. And then here we have a river otter. So river otters are so fascinating to me. Um, before I worked in the Everglades, I didn't know we had river otters at all, but we do, they're native here. So river otters are extremely good swimmers. They can dive depths of 65 feet and hold their breath for about five minutes. They also, as we can see, love eating fish and, and oysters and clams and all that type of stuff. They're very social. They like to travel in groups. But don't be fooled by how cute they are. They are aggressive and they will attack you. So again, let nature be wild and observe from a distance. Okay, so I had to show, of course, a sea turtle video. So sea turtles are some of my favorite species that live out in the Everglades. So we know that the Everglades ecosystem is freshwater. It's also saltwater. It includes our oceans, right? It includes our coastlines and within that are our sea turtles. So there are about five species of sea turtles found in Florida. That would be the loggerhead, the green, the leatherback, the Kemp's Ridley, and the Hawksbill. So most common, especially here in Miami-Dade County, we see main three, loggerhead, green, and leatherback, but it's overwhelmingly the loggerhead that we see nesting on our beaches. About 95% of the nests in Miami-Dade are the loggerheads. So all sea turtle species, unfortunately, are listed as threatened or endangered, and we're definitely trying to come up with solutions for that, hence why we have these sea turtle conservation programs. We have our wonderful marine center here providing education so people can become aware about these things. Um, we know, like I said before, that the East Coast is the largest nesting site, so we need a lot more awareness and education revolving around that. Um, only one out of a thousand hatchlings actually make it to adulthood. So it's a very, very small uh, chance. So we're trying to do everything we can to help them. So this is a video of a baby loggerhead sea turtle making its first steps to the ocean. And all, all these videos and pictures are taken by authorized personnel of the Miami-Dade County Sea Turtle Conservation Program with their, their permit from the FWC, just letting you guys know. So I wanted to show you guys this. That makes my heart warm every time I see it. <laughs> so, sorry, I got a full screen it. So that was a baby loggerhead making its way to the ocean. Just think about that. So loggerhead, I mean, sea turtles in general, they hatch from these eggs. Um, their nests are like a, a light bulb shape that the mother digs and buries. She never sees the babies again. She just leaves that nest to incubate and eventually they hatch. They have to crawl out of that tunnel to the surface of the beach and you know hopefully they they usually will hatch around the same time and they're able to use each other's um, energy and motion to push off each other to to come out of that nest um, unfortunately if they don't hatch you know at the same time if say one hatches later it's going to be a lot harder for him to come out of that nest so think about all the struggles that these sea turtles have to deal with once it comes out it's running for its life basically to get to that water because there's birds picking at it and there's other like lizards and things that are trying to eat them 
So it's, it's just absolutely extraordinary how they're brand new in the world, seconds old, and they're able to instinctually know they have to go towards the water. So another issue we have here in you know the east coast of Florida, we have lots of hotels and lots of restaurants on the beach, and that is a huge problem for our sea turtles. You know, a huge part of our economy here in Florida is tourism, but how do we balance that with our nature, right? So our sea turtles, they are, all sea turtles are able to follow the moonlight's reflection off of the waves of the ocean. They usually hatch at night um, and they're able to follow that reflection to the ocean. But unfortunately with all this light pollution that we have from the, the hotels and the restaurants, these sea turtles are going west instead of east to the water. So they'll actually be found in hotel pools. They'll be found in the parking lots. They're found all over and you know that's not helping their chances at all. So there's definitely some things that we still need to work on and fix in terms of protecting these endangered species. So talking more about threats, we love our Everglades. It's a wonderful place. Unfortunately, it has a lot of problems. So there's many threats to our Everglades. Of course, we have encroaching humans. We are continually growing. There's said to be about a thousand people moving to Florida per day. So that explosive population growth surely has its impacts on our environment. As we know, we have extreme habitat loss. We're building more and more houses, businesses, and taking away from our Everglades. We have invasive species. That's a huge issue. We have pollution, overconsumption of resources, and climate change and sea level, sea level rise. So we're really trying to figure out this multi-dimensional complex um, situation and do it in the most effective and responsible way possible. It's just, it's a, it's a lot to fix. So, you know, we're trying to figure it out. <laughs> um, but water quality. So historically, like I said, the Everglades would move from the Orlando area down to the Florida Bay. Now with increased population growth and the um, Everglades agricultural area being just south of Lake Okeechobee, that forced people to put a dam around Lake Okeechobee so it doesn't overflow the agricultural area and also to divert or move the water east and west, losing that fresh water to tide. We're wasting fresh water, we're sending it to the ocean so it solidifies, it, it mixes with salt. And now we're having drier um, seasons in the southern part of the Everglades watershed and that has its own imp impacts on nesting seasons for birds and the amount of fish that can withhold during a certain time. There's lots of problems associated with changing the direction of the water and the amount of water that is moving south. So we also see seagrass die-offs, toxic blue-green algae, red tide, algal blooms, amongst many things. So it's very, you know, very not, it's not good. <laughs> and we have now a comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. So this is one of the one of the world's um, largest, most expensive restoration plans, and that is right here in our backyards. And that is what my environmental nonprofit, Everglades Foundation. That's what we are working towards, really um, helping manage and helping push. So this restoration plan is to kind of we can never have the the water should back to its natural state per se, but try to get there as much as possible. So there's a lot of things that need to be done. It's a very complex situation, hence why it's so expensive. It takes so long. Um, we're in the beginning steps of this, this plan actually. So the nickname is CERP, SERP, Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. We want to fix the quantity of water. So increase the total spatial extent to the natural areas. We want to make sure more water is flowing south like it historically used to. We wanna make sure that the quality of the water is healthy. So we have an issue with our Everglades agricultural area down south of Lake Okeechobee. And when water is running off, when it's flowing 
from the agricultural area, it contains a lot of nutrients, a lot of excess nutrients that are not good. So we have a lot of fertilizer runoff. Um, we have some septic tank seepage, things like that. And that's really affecting the quality of the water. And that runs all the way down to our Florida Bay, along the coast, everywhere. So it really affects the whole system. So we're trying to make sure we can naturally filter that out. They're talking, we have some human-made wetlands that are able to to soak up some of that with our plant species. We also wanna fix the timing of the water. Historically, we're able to store water the perfect amounts, you know, during the perfect season. It's naturally, the system functions as it should. When humans come into play, we really mess things up. So we mess up the timing of that. That messes with the breeding season of, of different animals, etc. We also wanna fix the distribution. So the water that's captured, we want to fix the distribution throughout throughout the rest of the ecosystem so that we can have all parties be happy. The urban dwellers, the agricultural users, and the actual nature, the actual species. So there's a lot of stuff that we have to work on. <laughs> and this project was actually proposed since 2000, year 2000. So it's been over 20 years now. And there's only been one project out of more than, I think, 60 or 50 different projects, only one that has been completely uh, fulfilled. So we have a long way to go and we really are stuck on, you know, permitting. There's so many components that go into it. Also the funding aspect is a huge part of it. So it's supposed to be a 50, 50 deal between the federal government and the state. So we really want to have a match system where they're both contributing to the, to the success of this. So that's always a hurdle that we have to deal with each year when the government lets out their budget. So you know, work in progress. We'll see how it goes. It's it's going along really well now. Thankfully, it's been really good recently. On a happy note, <laughs> I wanted to show you guys this adorable video. So part of our solutions in Everglades restoration is protecting our species, especially in, in urban areas. So we have our US 41, we have Alligator Alley, you know, all of these highways that are uh, you know, risking these animals lives. So we want to make sure we have wildlife corridors, which are pathways that go under highways so that these animals can pass through without getting hurt. So this is just a really fun video. I love it. It's a hidden wildlife camera and it shows you just how many animals live in the Everglades. So let's, let's watch it. Awesome. I love that video. It's so wholesome. So, okay, pop quiz. Was that an American alligator or was that an American crocodile in the video? Let's see who paid attention. Again, I see lots of questions in the chat. I'll be sure to answer some of or all of them when we finish. Taylor says alligator. Anyone else? Anyone oppose her? So you are correct, Taylor. <laughs> that is the American alligator. So we could tell by that why the U-shaped snout and this habitat. I don't know if you guys could tell, but it's definitely not saltwater or coastal habitat. So that's kind of a giveaway. Great job. So I'm going to wrap up my, my presentation with a question for you all. What can you do to help protect our water supply, the Everglades species and the ecosystem overall. So things that we can do as individuals, 
um, I have some example images on the screen here. So we have various, various ways. There's a lot we can do as individuals. Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, so cleaning up water bodies, doing beach cleanups, park cleanups, all of that stuff is very directly impactful. Yeah, Taylor, changing our lights, exactly. I had to put the sea turtle stuff in there. <laughs> yeah, so changing our lights. So like I said before, the sea turtles are sometimes deterred from the ocean. They go the opposite direction because they're attracted to the lights of the, the buildings, right? But we've learned that if we change the color of the lights to, let's say, an amber color or like a red light, that the sea turtles do not react as much to that. So they're, they're really harmless if you change your light bulbs. And that is a huge impact and it's quite easy to do, really. Yeah, so petitions, legislation, of course. Always, always, always don't use single-use plastics. Amazing. So reusable water bottles, I have mine right here, yes. And um, yeah, so even an example here, I have the Protect the Panther license plate, little things that we can do like voting with our dollars. So when we spend money on Protect the Panther license plate, that fund goes towards the conservation and the restoration for the Florida Panthers. So little things make a big difference, right? And then this is a sign that is posted on all of our sea turtle nests. So if you ever see a roped off sea turtle nest on the beach, usually there's a sign there that says, do not disturb sea turtle nests. Violators are subject to fines and imprisonment. So it's actually a very, very big deal um, with the law if you were to disturb a sea turtle nest. So we always wanna make sure, do not disturb nature, let it be. That's one of the best things you can do for it really. Yeah, no digging holes or leaving sandcastles. Yes, that was something I forgot to mention. In the sea turtle video, um, there was a small indent in the beginning, and that little loggerhead baby actually fell into it. Thankfully, it was small enough that he was able to get out. But I wanted to really hone in on the fact that little holes, depressions in the sand, can make a huge difference when these guys are hatching and when they have to make it to the ocean. So if you are at the beach, before you leave, make sure you level out that sand. It's such a small action, takes seconds to do, and it makes a huge difference. Awesome. Okay, so who should you call if someone's bothering a sea turtle nest or sea turtle mom? Can you call someone if there's people using white lights on the beach at night? Excellent questions. Yeah, so you should call, there is a number, I didn't put it in this PowerPoint presentation, um, but there are sea turtle conservation programs. You can look them up. There's a Broward County one, there's a Miami-Dade County one, there's one for each area, municipality. So really you can just Google it, you can find their number there or FWC and absolutely educate people if they're using white lights on the beach, just tell them politely, hi, did you know that actually disturbs sea turtles and we're in sea turtle nesting season? Um, just let them know so that you know they're educated and they know why not to do it. But certainly you can um, figure that out. Let me see some other questions. Can helping the Everglades help stop algal blooms? Why have those gotten so bad the past few years? Great question. So 100% restoring the Everglades is going to help stop algal blooms, at least the you know intensity. So actually red tide events and algal blooms, that's a natural process that does happen. It's not as much as it's been happening. So that has been exacerbated due to excess nutrient discharge and runoff from our Everglades agricultural area, from you know, us humans fertilizing our beautiful green grass and our lawns and things that has uh, run off into our coastal areas and really exacerbated that algal growth. So if you ever see guacamole looking water, that is really toxic actually for humans. And, you know, every good restoration will help fight that by improving the quality of the water, helping filter out those excess nutrients with natural or man-made wetland systems. 
great. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing here and answer some more questions. You guys, these are great questions. <laughs> um, let me see, new message. Do I have advice for people who want to get involved? Any petition legislation to follow or groups they can join or places they can volunteer? So yes. So to get involved, I say the biggest thing you can do is to educate yourself first and then relay the message. Always politely educate people when you can, talk about it, have conversations. Really just spreading awareness is so much more of a bigger impact than what we would assume. Um, you know, there's definitely petitions and legislation out there. There are so many groups you can find on social media. Simply just type in Everglades or hashtag Everglades and you can find, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole of different organizations. You can look at Everglades Foundation, who we partner with on our Instagram, our Facebook, things like that. And just go from there. Just follow, I usually just follow organizations that are similar or, you know, there'll be suggested ads, things like that. And then usually seeing their posts, I can find petitions and things like that. So yeah, and there's absolutely so many beach cleanup volunteer groups. Um, it's really about getting out there, searching for it and uh, meeting people, networking, really. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, I appreciate it, you guys. Any other questions? Um, you can find us at Everglades, let me type it in the chat. Everglades Literacy, let me see, yeah, perfect, thank you guys, it was such a pleasure for, um, thank you for having me. Thank you so much, um, I think that we got through all of those questions, um, if you do think of any questions that you uh, don't think of till later, feel free to email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu, um, don't forget to check out EvergladesLiteracy.org. If we can't answer a question that you email us, I'll be sure to send it right along um, because you are obviously very, very well versed, such an expert in the Everglades. I learned so much today about things that we don't usually get to talk about. Um, if you guys did make any of this presentation, it is recorded. Um, I'll do a quick edit and then post it onto our YouTube page. Get my Girl Scout troop the Everglades soon. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. I love that. That's awesome. Um, Otherwise, uh, today is the 17th, so next week we do have another webinar, again at 1 p.m., same uh, link, um, and we are going to be talking to some of our friends uh, through Broward County who are going to teach us a little bit about sea turtle lighting, which we touched upon today. So excited. Um, that is a huge, huge, huge issue, especially in South Florida with all of the, all the tourism, everyone on the coast. Um, like we do like having our lights here, um, but we will talk a little bit about those specific issues, what you could do to help um, and other things about protecting our sea turtles. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Annalise. That was very, very cool. Um, if you have any socials and things that you want us to attach to the video so everyone here can follow you, I'll make sure to follow up with that later. Yes, absolutely. We have a Facebook page, Everglades Literacy Program, Facebook or Everglades Foundation, Facebook, Instagram. Um, you can always go on our website. Like I said, it's EvergladesLiteracy.org. So awesome. thank you guys. Thank you. Um, we'll hopefully see you all next week. Thanks again, Annalise. Stay safe out there. Thank you. You too.